Ian Bounds was born in Missouri at age 19, decided to get into law, became the youngest practicing lawyer at age 19 in Missouri. Did that for a few years. Midway through his 20s, had an encounter with the Lord, opened his eyes to the beauty of Jesus, and he gave his life fully to God and said, I'm getting into ministry. I don't know what that looks like. I'm giving up a great career, but I'm all in. He started pastoring a church in Missouri right in the midst of the Civil War. The, the union comes in. He's a southern church. He ends up, they assume he's a Confederate sympathizer, put him in jail for a year and a half, even though his brother served in the, in the Union Army. They didn't care. They put him in jail. He's there ministering to these Confederate soldiers. Finally, after a year and a half, they let him out. He's got such a heart for these Confederate soldiers, he decides to sign up to be a chaplain for the Confederate Army. Hated slavery, wrote against it, but said, these guys need Jesus, so I'm getting in, and I'm getting in the game, and I'm loving these guys. He was a part of the 3rd Missouri Infantry, which ended up being a part of the Battle of Franklin back in 1864. So he's there. The, the, the day before, the battle started at 4 p.m., the day leading up, he's praying with all these troops who are freaked out. It was the South's last stand, really, and he's going through, and he's praying with them, and he's, he knows Hundreds, if not thousands of these people will not be living tomorrow. They're about to face a holy God, and he's praying uh, for their salvation. So much so, the guys are kind of making fun of him. He's a little short, five-foot-five five guy, and he's walking along with this big backpack, and they're like, who's that backpack with a person on the front, you know, and kind of lightening the mood. And he's just praying with them and asking God to work in their life. And sure enough, 4 o'clock, the battle hits for the next 36 hours. He, he gives of himself, finding, just getting bodies and throwing them into mass graves, trying to repair whatever they could. A year later, the war ends. He goes back home to Missouri, but after a few months, just cannot stand, uh, cannot help but think about what happened here in Franklin. So he came back, and it was a mess. He helped rebuild the town. He, built, he, he dug up those mass graves and gave them formal burial sites for each one of those soldiers. And then the Methodist church had no pastor, so he said, hey, I'll do it. It becomes the preacher there, and it was a mess. And I read in one of the biographies about what his time here at Franklin was like. He said, when Brother Browns came to Franklin, he found the church in a wretched state. It was near the close of four years of war. Much of the time they had been without a pastor. Its leadership had become depleted and the world had crept into the church through the outside. What Bounds immediately did was search out half a dozen men who really believed in the power of prayer. With these fellows, the young pastor, he was only 29 at the time, met every Tuesday night. They got on their knees together and they prayed for revival, for themselves, for the church, and for the town. And for over a year, this faithful band called upon the Lord until God finally answered by fire. The revival came down without any previous announcement or plan. It said they didn't even call an evangelist in. It lasted for several weeks and in the end, 10% of Franklin's population was coming to E.M. Bounds Little Church and over 150 people got saved within a matter of weeks. And that happened two and a half miles down that way. Man, there's a part of me reading that that goes, oh God, would you do that again? I read one time that crisis always precedes renewal. That when the world is going crazy, that's all of a sudden when the Holy Spirit begins to work and people begin to be hungry and they go, you know what, social media and these, all these news outlets and vacation homes, they're just not enough. Is there anything else, God? And at that moment, God goes, there is something else. And he begins to move in power. And I've just wondered, even praying this week, God, would you do that again? I have no idea what it looks like. I don't think it's this crazy, emotional, whatever. I just think it's God moving so much so that we can't stop him. And is there a couple of us here who would go, God, we want that so bad. We want that more than political, whatever. We want that better than the Titans winning the Super Bowl. We want God to move. And I believe, because he's done it all throughout history, that when some of us are so hungry and desperate for that, that he'll answer it. He wants it more than we do. Would we be faithful as a church to pray, to just as simply as we can, to just say, God, would you move in the way that you move? Don't let us make up any part of it. We just want you to move. It always exists in confession of sin, and it always exists in ways we could have never planned. So we better buckle up. <laughs>